with clinical um, and lab. And you can go into HESI and do practice questions for your pharmacology. Everybody with me? HESI, practice questions, pharmacology, if you wish. Got it? With your fundamentals. In the front of that fundamentals book, you guys, a bunch of you have already done it, right? So you take this, you scratch off this code and you put it in and it takes you to what's called Davis Advantage. We've been saying Davis Plus. Um, Davis Advantage basically houses the Davis Plus and Edge. Okay, are you hearing me? So when you go into Davis Advantage, um, up at the top in the top banner, I think the banner is purple, I wanna say. In the top banner, uh, the, underneath the, where you put the web, uh, where you put the web address right below that, there's options there. And there's an option in the middle of it called PLP. P is in Peter, L is in, I can't think of one L word. LASIK. LASIK. <laughs> Thank you, I don't know, my mind just went totally blank. And then P is in Peter again, PLP, Llama, yeah. Okay, I appreciate you all very much. Thank you, uh-huh. They're all giving me L words. I love y'all. Okay, PLP. When you click on PLP up at the top and then you look just over to the right, you're gonna see a two toggle switch. And the, the one on the left says advantage, the one on the right says edge. So that's one way that you, and you can just toggle between them. If you do advantage, that's what we've been talking to you about with the plus. So there's a pretest. You cannot go back and retake that pretest. Then there's some video explanation, whatever. And then there's a post test in that advantage component, which we have been referring to as plus. Okay. Then you can toggle over and you can do edge questions, which is what we have been talking about. It's just all housed under this one code in the front of your book. Does that make sense to everybody? I know it's been confusing and I know that we were also confused. So we wanted to clarify um, where you find everything. You do not have to enter a uh, the class. You can if you wish, but you can just go straight when you go into Advantage, you can just go straight into content if you wish. You can create practice quizzes, yes. Edge is practice for NCLEX, yep, so they're NCLEX style questions, they build in difficulty, but you won't necessarily get just questions on chapters one and eight, for example. Exemplify is exam soft, so that's how we test. Normally, under normal situations, you guys would, um, all you would do is change your password and then you guys would come in here to the classroom, sit at our computers and take your test. Because you guys are at home, we had to have you download Exemplify onto your computer. So Exemplify is separate and that's how we do our testing. Okay, so you log in to ExamSoft and you change your password and you download Exemplify. And then you, you click on the icon on your desktop. So whenever you take a test on Exemplify, you're not going back into the internet you're clicking that icon on your desktop. And then you'll take whatever the practice quiz this week on Exemplify. So I did, you do not need a separate code because it's all together, correct. Advantage houses both components, the chapter questions, specific chapter questions, and the edge questions. How do we make chapter quizzes for Advantage? Um, you have to scroll down on that main page and there's different options for you. Um, and one of them is to create quizzes. When I do it, it doesn't work. It tells me to pick something from the drop down menu on the top left. When you go, when you go into FA Davis, can you see the book icon with the options? Like there's resources and advantage.
No, we are not doing Davis Edge and Advantage for class exams. Uh-uh. Nope. Mm -mm. We have an amazing pass rate. Do you know why that is? <laughs> because we don't rely on the textbook to create qu quiz questions for you guys. But I appreciate the offer. If you did not receive an email for ExamSoft, you need to email me and I will send you your passcode with instructions for what to do for ExamSoft. NCLEX style questions are multiple choice, are select all that apply, are hot spot, fill in the blank, drop down. Um, the practice questions, NCLEX style questions that you're practicing will be similar format, yes. You have to view the class. Okay. Did I answer everybody's questions or did I miss anything? Everybody feel good? I have one more thing. So uh, Professor McCowan put up about access to the videos, but there also was a question about stethoscopes for lab. You do not bring your stethoscopes to lab that you're going to be using in clinical. So they will provide you stethoscopes in lab. Is that everything we want to discuss this morning? When you go, um, when you go into Edge, does it, uh, um, Edge should allow you to pick concepts as well to create your own quiz. They're asking for clarification, Lisa. Uh, for the stethoscope? The so stethoscope in the nurse pack is, is for, for clinical. Yes, they will provide you a stethoscope in lab. So they've had several donated. Or you can use another stethoscope for clinical, but you just need to keep it separate from lab. You definitely need to clean it thoroughly before you take it home. Uh, there was a question about the skills lab videos. You need to go back and look at that skills and simulation tab <clears throat> under the 1710 course site and that gives you all the information that you need with weekly assignments. So if you have specific questions, Carmen, then you need to reach out to your lab faculty member. But it should be pretty clear if it's vital signs, you're gonna watch the videos on vital signs, et cetera. Is that everything? Any other questions? No, you do not need to print the checklist, Sasha. They'll have them for you in lab. I don't know when the lab quiz is. Again, you'll have to look on the lab schedule. It will tell you. Exam soft question, Dr. Belknap. Okay, so it's a little different with ExamSoft when you're at home versus when you're here. When you are able to take exams here, as soon as you are done taking the exam, it will show you your missed questions and answers. So when you are done, you will get a quick review. Your faculty, Arna Poe, myself, and Professor Stam, we will also provide a live review time for you guys to be able to come in um, social distancing, of course, and all of that kind of fun stuff, but to look at your specific missed questions and go through it. Because right after a test, you can see what you missed, but you're not in the process of learning. You're not, it, it's a whole different ball game. So we provide time for you guys to come back and look at your stuff and really try to figure out where you went wrong. So you'll have two opportunities to see your missed questions here at campus. If you have to test at home, we have to do it a little differently. So 
I set up the critical thinking test the same way that you would at home. Um, so you cannot see missed questions if you're at home. But on Monday, we have the optional Zoom time where we will pull up the, the exam questions and we're gonna walk through the correct answers and how to use test taking strategies to look at those questions and help figure out what was right and what was wrong. So when you're at home, things are a bit different because we have to make stronger uh, restrictions for the security of our tests. When you're here, you will be able to look at your missed questions at the end. Uh, the mock test is due by, I don't know, whenever I put it. I put it on the, I, I don't know. I put it on the announcement. I don't remember. <clears throat> yeah, so you won't be able to review your test. Um, and and normally there, it's a different password. I will look at that. Um, did it give you an option to review? I will look at the quiz. Regardless, you can't review your test. So we're starting to eat into Professor Arnipal's lecture time. So again, uh, Dr. Belknap and I will come on at 1030. And if you guys want to stay on and ask more questions, we can do that then. You guys see everything OK with this? Can you see my slideshow? Yeah, OK. All right, and like she said, if there's any other questions, there's always emails if you have any other questions for it. I'm just getting this up. We'll get started. Good morning, everyone. We've spent a few minutes discussing how everything's going, but let's get started with nursing lecture. So I want to start with vital signs, which is going to be your entire lecture this morning. Can someone tell me what a vital sign is? Like what it specifically means? Info about the body, I like it. Health status, temperature is one of them. But in general, you guys are getting it, blood pressure. Yeah, we're talking specifically about things that happen in the body and how we can measure those. I'm going to preface all my lectures when we talk about this with this. We are not memorizing anything. We are understanding things. So as you start getting labs, as you start getting vital signs, as you start getting these numbers, I don't want you to memorize them as much as I want you to understand what they mean. Because as you'll see in this lecture, things can change and you need to be able to recognize that change. So vital signs, a few of you already said this, but it gives you information about the body's overall status. And it can be affected by any body system. Renal, it can be affected by cardiac, it can be affected by the integumentary system. Anything can deal with vital signs. For us to measure a vital sign, we have to have something specific. We have to have proper equipment to be able to access and assess vital signs. To hear the belly, we're not gonna stick our ears on that person, we have a stethoscope for that. You know, we can check pulses with our hands, but we have a lot of different tools that we'll discuss to help us with this. So I want to make sure that you know that when you assess a vital sign, make sure you know how to assess it, what you're looking for, and what you're going to need to actually assess that. There was a nurse that I had, I was friends with when she was a, when I was in night shift, who always came in with no stethoscope, completed all of her charts though, and upon chart review, she always said that she auscultated the lungs or heard what was going on in the lungs, heard what was going on in the belly. Do you think she put her ear on there? Do you think she specifically went through and, and went to listen without a stethoscope? What do you guys think? No, she probably just charted it and people started catching on that she wasn't bringing it and she wasn't charting appropriately. She wasn't assessing her patient. So she, needs to make, she needed to make sure she had one of those. You need to make sure you know what you need to be able to take care of your patient and assess them appropriately. So 
few vital signs. We've got temperature, heart rate, respirations, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, and pain, which depending on the book that you're reading, it does talk about pain as a vital sign. Uh, more and more research is starting to go in vi uh, pain coming, uh, being pulled out of a vital sign, but it is in your textbook still a vital sign using scales and Wong Baker faces, which again will be in there later. I'm going to throw out numbers as we go through this because this is something you just need to know. Um, I'm going to base all my numbers on averages in your textbook, but know that your where you work may give you a different set of numbers. It may require you to know other things. So let's start with temperature. 96.8 to 100.4 is the normal range. Heart rate, 60 to 100 beats per minute. Respirations, 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Your oxygen saturation, 95 to 100%. And again, your pain, normal pain should be zero, but then you can go into other situations. And you will see those again. If you didn't hear that, you will hear that again on this lecture. So monitoring vital signs. It's performed on a regular basis. Now, regular basis can mean a lot of different things. It depends on where you're at. Um, oh, I see you said I missed blood pressure. No, that's because I didn't say it. I'm sorry. Under It's one, less than 120 over 80 on your textbook. Yeah, it should never be zero. Um, you know, that's not your normal. <laughs> so uh, for monitoring your vital signs, again, it depends on where you're at. If you're in a nursing home, you may get that checked once a week, once a month. Uh, if you're in a hospital, Every four hours is usually the standard on there. Um, but of course it can be eight hours, depending on what unit they're at. Um, every time you visit a doctor's office, they check your vitals. Is that every six months? Is that once a year? That's when they check it. It depends on where you're at and what location you're working in. And then frequency can also be determined by a provider or the nurse. Now these are guidelines. If you have a patient you're worried about and you're, you've just gotten vitals, it's been an hour, you feel like, okay, you know, something's wrong though, I wish I could check vitals again, do it. You don't need an order to check vitals. If you feel that something's wrong, go check the vitals, do it. You don't have to find anybody and say, can I do that? Do I have permission to do that? Go intervene, go find those vitals and figure out what's going on because you may miss something if you wait three more hours to get those vital signs. Now, I will say with that caveat, you can choose to increase your vital checks, but if somebody or if a provider specifically says, I want it checked every hour, you can't say, mm, it's fine, I, I'll check it at four. You have a specific order at that point to check it at that hour. So remember, you as a nurse can choose to increase the frequency, but not decrease the frequency if a provider overrides that. So when do you take vital signs? Pretty much, again, you've got your every four to six hours, but when somebody gets admitted to your care, check the vital signs. Uh, if there's a change in condition, something looks different to you, something looks odd, patient's not acting the way he was 20 minutes ago, check the vital signs um, as needed. Or if, they're about, if you're about to give medication that will change their blood pressure, will change their vital signs, check it before to make sure it's, something they should actually be taking at that time period. Um, and again, per policy. And if you're intervening with something, uh, if you feel like if they've currently lost blood volume or had a fall, again, a change in status, check the blood, check the uh, vital signs, help them figure out something's gone wrong with it. Did I skip over one? So for heat production, I want to mention something. Why does the body increase heat? Yeah, the slide's not there for temperature, so I'm going to go over that. And if you see body temperature, I don't know why it's not popping up. 
but why does the body increase heat? Homeostasis, okay, to kill bad bacteria, fight off infection, absolutely. Besides fighting an infection, why would your body try and increase its own temperature? I see homeostasis. Give me something else besides fighting an infection. Stay warm, good. Shivering, think about that, okay? Hypothermia, yeah, to stay warm, that's another one. Adjustment to the environment. We can increase it. As our body temperature decreases, our body starts recognizing it, and we say, ah, uh, we need to fix that. We don't wanna have any problems. Absolutely, so we've got fighting infections, we've got keeping warm. Um, why would our body try and lower our own temperature then? Cool off. And the infection goes away. Don't forget that. You know, you'd expect that to happen. You know, absolutely too hot, cool down. You know, if that infection starts to go away, you've actually treated them appropriately and if things are starting to happen, their body may begin to, should begin to lower that temperature. So heat production, now that we're on this slide. Basal metabolic rate or BMR. It's the amount of energy used at the, uh, by the body at rest is what that means, okay? Um, a lower BMR means we give off less heat, a higher BMR means we give off more heat. For exercise, we have an increase in friction, skeletal movement, we have an increase in temperature. Uh, activity and exercise, uh, sex, environmental, anything can change our temperature. If it's freezing outside, our body temperature will slowly decrease. If it's extremely hot outside, we're adjusting to it our body will slowly increase and try and decrease that temperature. Now, with infections, is it possible for our body to get too hot? Absolutely. Yeah, oh yes, I love it. Everybody's going quick. Absolutely. It's absolutely possible to have unsafe levels of temperatures. And that's, again, why we're checking that. Somebody gets 105, somebody goes up that high, oh no, you know, we've got to make sure, because they're starting to have protein breakdown inside of their body at that point. And we are worried about permanent damage from a fever at that. Circadian rhythm. Circadian rhythm is just, you know, that change. It's a change in temperature overall that occurs from one to two degrees over a day. Uh, usually it's a little cooler in the morning and it goes up by temperature or two uh, in the afternoon. Uh, for age, uh, yes, it is different. The, the, I am teaching you adults with this, just so you know. For vital signs, I'm giving you the average in adults. When you get to pediatrics, you will learn a different set of vitals. But questions right now are going to be based on adults. Good question, though. And you want to make sure you know that it is different because what you would treat somebody or you would recognize something in a pediatric child to be normal with a heart rate of 100, you know, going into 120, 130 versus an adult, which you'd be like, no, that's too much. Thermal regulation. So we have something called the hypothalamus in our brain. It recognizes when our body is hot or cold and helps create a what's called a set point to make sure that our body tries to cool itself off or heat itself up to a certain point. We wanna keep that homeostasis and fight off infections because we can raise or lower that set point if we start recognizing something's wrong in our body or something's there that shouldn't be. Uh, yes, absolutely what I'm seeing on this, I'm reading these as we're going through. Um, yes, athletes specifically, especially long-term athletes can have a lower heart rate and that be normal again we assess our patients. We talk about this and figure out if that's normal, but I'm giving you averages. When we're talking about body regulation, we're looking at vasodilation and vasoconstriction being two of the main things. We can dilate or widen our blood vessels when we're too hot to give off heat out of that blood area. And then vasoconstriction, we can na narrow it and keep the blood in there and help keep the temperature where it needs to be. Now, the next two slides have some terms that you will need to know to start, and you need to understand and start thinking about when you're going through taking care of patients. Uh, conduction, a transfer of heat from a warm to a cool surface. The conduction is the image on the bottom, okay? That is a bag of ice being put onto a hot wound. 
cold onto a direct, or with direct contact, your temperature changing. Versus convection, which is the image on top, which would be you know, cold air blowing through the AC over your body, helping decrease the surface temperature and overall decreasing the temperature of the person. For radiation, we have a it's just, just a large majority of body uh, heat loss with this. So we have loss of heat through electromagnetic waves emitting through this. If a patient is cold, and they don't have a fever, if a patient is cold, give them a blanket to help so they don't lose all their body temperature, okay? Uh, you can use sunlight to help warm up a patient that's cool on top of that. If a patient is hot and the room is cold, you have heat loss from the patient into the air. That's how you think through this. So con I see that question about convection and radiation. So convection would be through, uh, let's see, heat through current of air or, wa uh, air or water, radiation of heat through electromagnetic waves. So it's slightly different. So you're dealing with actual air currents with convection, where radiation is just coming off or radiating off of your body. Does that help? Good. Good. And then evaporation, many of you probably heard of this one, but you know, the perspiration. Uh, it's your water on skin. You know, you're sweating, the water evaporates, and evaporation takes heat from the body. Um, it also occurs with breathing with insensible loss when you slowly lose water whenever you take a breath. This is just showing you your percentage of heat loss as you go through what happens on a daily basis, again, on average. Core temperature. This is just a lot of numbers on here, uh, but I want you to highlight that on the bottom. The acceptable range currently is 96.8 to 100.4. And I have a question for you all. Where is the most accurate point in the body for a, body, for a core temperature? Anal rectal, anal rectal, temporal artery, rectal, rectal, etc. I have yet to see the right answer. I'm going to say that because my question was, where is the best, the best core temperature? Not where is the best place to take the core temperature? Liver, liver, absolutely. The best way to check your core temperature is the liver, but you're not going to go and stab somebody with a thermometer. So rectal would be one of the best ways to do that. Absolutely. Um, when you do these temperatures, especially if you're doing oral, um, be sure they haven't had a cup of coffee or a glass of ice water, you know, right before you do it. It is going to change that. You know, wait about 20 to 30 minutes if you can before you take that temperature. If they realize, if you're like, oh man, your temperature is 100, 101. Oh, I just had coffee. Okay, let's recheck that in 20 minutes before I, you know, start thinking you have an infection. Let's think about what caused that. Or if they haven't had anything, then I'm worried about it. So far, it's making sense. Any questions on this so far? Good, okay, we'll keep rocking then. Surface temperature, it works great. Lower than core temperature, you just have to recognize that it is lower than core temperature. It's less invasive though, you can actually see this. Christy, blood thinners, don't really change the temperature of what's going on with that. With It just deals with your platelets at that point. And your clotting. All right, variances in temperature. So I love words. I love the Latin base, the Greek base. It helps so much when you get into nursing school. If you haven't had it, that's okay, because I'm about to crash course you. Pyrexia. High temp, that's what it means. Pyre is fire or high. So when we have somebody with a fever, we give them Tylenol, which is the class known as antipyretics. We help with that, okay? Just trying to throw some words at you to kind of help you think through this. 
So fever, pyrexia, something over that 100.4. Uh, abnormally high temperature over 100 or 37.8 degrees Celsius. But I want you to think with a fever, it's not just medications that we can give. We can give them cool drinks. We can open a window. We can take a, you know, six different blankets that someone's put on them from family to help them feel better. Take it off of them. We can help them feel better. Um, if they're shivering and they have a fever, you don't want to throw a blanket on top of them, but you could give them like a light sheet to help with that. Maybe take some of that cool air off of them. Now, hyperpyrexia, 105.8. For the, uh, you, I don't know how long we're gonna be doing Zoom, but for, the, for, for a while, you're gonna hear me say this if there's something you need to know. This is a butt pucker. If you see this, like, oh gosh, do something, okay? You need to respond when you see this fever. This is uh, something's happening. I'm not going to wait 30 minutes to see what's going on. I'm gonna go re-verify. That's the correct temperature. I'm gonna go assess my patient. I'm gonna see what's happening. I want you to know that as you get into these vital signs and you start seeing these vital signs, that there are numbers, once you hit a certain point, you just need to, in, you just need to think I need to do something. And you may not know what to do right now, but you can at least see. Somebody has 105 degree temperature, something's wrong. Hypothermia, you guys, several of you have already said something about hypothermia, but it's just a low temperature or low temperature, hypo temperature. Core temperature is below 95 degrees. Again, this should make sense to you if you have a normal range and it's below or above hypo and hyper should just kind of make sense to you why it's considered a problem. This could be, you know, due to extended exposure to cold weather, um, a lack of shelter. Now, if somebody's hypothermic, would you expect them to be sweating? No, we would not expect them to be sweating. Would you expect them to be shivering? Okay, think through that. That should, if that makes sense to you, you're on the right path. Just because I say hypothermic, what does that mean? What would you expect from a hypothermic patient? What would you expect to see? What would you expect to see someone from a hyperthermic? Would you expect to see them shivering to increase the temperature? If somebody's hyperthermic. No, we wouldn't expect to see shivering from somebody who has a 105 degree temperature. Something's wrong if they're doing that. So start thinking of what, what would I have and what would I expect that patient to be doing. Again, that's what I mean by understand, don't memorize. Now, this is a definition slide. Know what they mean. Okay, just kind of understand them. Uh, Celsius and Fahrenheit, it's a good one to recognize because your NCLEX can absolutely ask you Celsius versus Fahrenheit. Um, for sustained, fluctuate. It's less than a degree, but it's always above normal. Again, this is just by definition. Intermittent would be between normal high or low, uh, and remittent above 3.6, but stays above normal. Again, these are just definitions. But one of the key things I want you to recognize is that this is without medication. This is what the body's doing on its own. Yes, you can also memorize and convert. So heat stroke, since we're talking about this, I've already discussed a lot of different things, but this is why I wanted you guys to start thinking about it. So heat stroke, excuse me. This can lead to permanent thermal regulation issues because if it stays too long, you can damage your brain, specifically the hypothalamus, and then your set point isn't right for the rest of your life. So they have, once you have heat stroke once, you're more likely to have a risk of that for the rest of your life. So you have to be careful with it. So you're looking at over 103 degrees, they can't sweat, they're confused, lethargic. Again, we're at heat stroke. This is the bad version of it. We have also have heat exhaustion, which is where, you know, we're, we're getting really hot. We, we see sweating. Our heart rate starts to increase because we're trying to get rid of that heat. Okay. We're trying to promote that heat loss. And if we don't take care of it, it comes to this, which would be your heat stroke. You can have a temperature of 105 without a, uh, having a heat stroke. Yes, there could be other things. You could have a severe infection. 
Uh, there's just, this is just a version of what we're talking about with the hot environment. All right, remove, for hypothermia, remove the wet clothes. Why am I removing wet clothes on somebody who's hypothermic? Conduction, thank you. We went, went right into it, good. Okay, and yeah, we are, we have, wet clothes, somebody who's hypothermic, and then as air goes by, we release more of that heat. We want them off of that so we can dry them off and do whatever the problem is so we can get them warmed up again. We can give them hot liquids if they're awake enough for me to give them. We can give warm IV fluids to help bring that up. Heating blankets, blankets in general, as long as they're dry, uh, and make sure that you dry that patient. Now, early signs of this, Think of this, if you start getting cold, early signs should make sense. You have that bluing of the skin, cyanosis, shivering, poor coordination because your body's getting cold. Um, your body's trying to fix the problem with early signs. It's getting you to stop moving, it's getting you to shiver and start bringing everything back up. But if you wait too long, you get that temperature below 82.4, um, your body's not able to work at that point. That's why you have a certain temperature set because your body works best in that range. So if you're too low for too long, your body begins to fail. As one of my instructors used to call it, it's tardy to the party at this point. If you wait, if you don't see them until this point, you've got a lot of work to do to help this patient get back to normal. All right, I'm gonna give you two pages, I'm gonna give you a couple pages because there's a, it's not a lot, but there's advantages and disadvantages for temperature measurement sites, and I want you to make sure you know. Pages 425 through 427. There's a, there's a single uh, table there that should show you positives and negatives based on this. But just for example, uh, with the axilla, it's the, the, the advantage of that is it's easy to access, but it's inaccurate. It can be up to two degrees different. Uh, with the temporal artery, it's easy with a low chance of error and very accurate, but it's expensive to get that equipment. Uh, to get in those pages were 425 to 427. Thank you all for responding. I like this. With 100 people, it makes it nice when people respond. Now, caring for a client with a fever. Think like a nurse. This is your one of your big first slides. Think like a nurse, okay? I'm gonna give you another set of pages, 420 to 421, just kind of helps you think this, your textbook is brand new and is really nice because it has a new set of sections that are about interventions specifically on different disorders. And it helps you think about nursing diagnosis, which you haven't got to, but what you would do if you had this patient, what options would you have as a nurse to be able to do? So it does help you. Again, pages 420 and 421 with that. But think like a nurse. You know, if, if we start having a fever, we're going to need cultures. We're going to have to figure out what's causing this fever so we can treat it appropriately. Uh, we're going to need antibiotics. Best way to do that is to have those cultures. Uh, we need to lower the room temperature to help their, their core body stay lower instead of raising. And we want to help with airflow, give them fluids, and we can give medications like antipyretics, uh, NSAIDs, and we can give steroids to help decrease inflammation related to that fever. Cultures specifically tell us what is growing, what is causing the fever, what bacterium is the big problem that we need to treat. Because a lot of times when we start having a high fever, we're worried about what's called sepsis. We're worried about something growing all throughout the body, specifically the blood. You, uh, cultures are usually in tubes. If you have like an actual site of infection as well, like a wound bed, you can actually get a little sample from that as well. Again, when we get to cultures and wounds, we'll explain more of that. But yeah, usually when someone just comes to you with a fever, you'll just draw blood and get that culture from there. All right, you want to click or check, you want to NCLEX questions, here you go. Uh, let's start with it. The nurse would monitor the body temperature most closely, frequency in the care of what? Uh, someone with an infection, who's an infant, experienced heat stroke, or with a head injury. I see C's, I see A's, C's, A's, B's.
Okay? All right. One of them is the right answer. D. I see a lot of people. This I just threw. You wanted to know NCLEX questions, and we're going to start with it. D. Infection. Yes, absolutely need to watch that. Absolutely need to watch that temperature. But this question says is, the nurse would monitor the temperature most closely. So we're what's called a priority question. Who is going to die if you don't do it? Infection, okay? We're worried a little bit about it. Infant, we gotta check that temperature, we absolutely do. Heat stroke, we already said that we have to worry about those individuals. We have to worry about them because their brain is damaged and we may have a problem with that. They've experienced heat stroke. However, the most what we call acute individual is the one with the head injury because we don't know what's going on in that hypothalamus with a current head injury. So it may be just completely off or overreacting. The limit could be off. So that head injury would be the most correct answer. Get ready for the most correct answer for a lot of these. And I'm going to say this right now. Practice your NCLEX questions. I will give you lots of different things to help you start thinking through these questions. But like I said here, we're looking for most frequent. This is a priority question. So how you think through this most of the time is who will die if I don't do it? Pulse, okay? This is a definition slide. Understand what a pulse is. The waves of blood with an artery created by contraction of the left ventricle of the heart this is measuring how many times your heart is pumping, okay? The bottom two areas here are gonna be important for you to know when you get into cardiac, into your second year. This is cardiac output, stroke volume, again, very important, but don't try and delve into that right now. This is more of an introduction of it. Now, stroke, again, those are all kinds of things you wanna know. Understand the pulse is how many times your heart is pumping. How many times is it supposed to pump per minute? There you go. All right, 1600, thank you. Thank you. 12, 12 to 20? No. All right, there we go, 60 to 100, absolutely. 12 to 20, Anna, would be your breathing, but at least you're catching on to that. All right, so this is again going into more definitions. Each contraction of the left ventricle forces blood into uh, the aorta, causing increased pressure, yada, yada, yada. Your heart squeezes and blood goes out. That creates a pulse of fluid. Thus, you get a pulse. Does that make sense? Okay. And that pulse is what you feel when you do that. Now, systole, so I wish, I need to get a squeezy heart, but systole is that the bottom, is your heart actually, when we got talk about blood pressure and everything, we're talking about how the heart squeezes and that's the pressure going out. And it does mention in the, under the pulse, but I just wanna make sure you understand that, that systole is when the heart squeezes and the blood comes out. And diastole is when that blood, excuse me, that the blood begins to refill, so it's the least amount of pressure your uh, heart is feeling at that time, or your body is feeling at that time. So systole is your squeeze, and diastole is your rest, is how you remember those. Yes, because, and what they're saying, yeah, well, again, we'll get into more about that when we get into cardiac, but just remember those two terms. Oh, I'm from the West Coast. I should probably tell you that. So some of my words may sound weird. So I apologize if it's diastole. I may, you may say it differently, but as long as you get the idea. Uh, pulse rate. Hey, look, we've got our numbers in there again, 60 to 100. It's like it's important to know. Your average 70 to 80, but that normal rate 60 to 100. Common pulse points. So these are places you can check it. You've got the apical, port, uh, the apical section, which is the most accurate because you're specifically measuring the apex of the heart. Carotid, between the midline and the side of the neck. This is not to be done at the same time. You've got two of them. Don't put your fingers 
there. You're going to cause a major problem if you do that. You have to, you are professionals, your CPR trained. You recognize that you do one side versus the other and assessing that circulation, but don't do them both at the same time. Uh, you've got brachial and radial femoral, which is more for emergencies uh, and popliteal. The dorsal pedial, and then you can, you can check. And of course, the other thing with these is, excuse me, when we talk about pulses, other than the apex, we're talking bilateral. So if we check the left side, we check the right side. So if I'm going to check my pulse here, I'm going to check my pulse here to see if they're equal, okay? Usually when we talk about assessment, I'll talk about this more when we get to it, but you usually check them both because it's a lot easier to see if one side's thready versus the other if you do them both at the exact same time. It's given you just a quick map where to look for. Uh, Jennifer, to answer your question, why would one side be different? That would be a disorder. Something's causing it. Could be a blockage, could be a clot, uh, could be the way the person's sitting, usually not. But we want to make sure that we check it because that's what we're assessing for. We're looking for differences. This is more giving you the areas of where we're going to check. Here's your apical. All right, measurement of a pulse. This is per your textbook, okay? Your radial pulse is checked for 30 seconds. And if it's regular, meaning beat, bump, 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 you can check it for 30 seconds and then multiply the number by two. And you can do that with an apical. Let me give you this right now. If anything is off, if you feel it and you get to 29 seconds and it feels off, do the full minute. Absolutely do the full minute because you don't want to be wrong because you guessed at the 30. The textbook does not say 15 seconds times four. The textbook does not say 10 seconds times six. It says 30 seconds times two if regular. I'm glad you like those pictures. Apical being the most accurate. So radial versus apical. I've already told you what I'm measuring with the apical. Why would apical be the most accurate? Yeah, absolutely, the heart. You're measuring the apex of the heart's pulse. So you're measuring that actual contraction when you do that. Good, good. Definition slide with no definition on it. So good stuff to know in here. Apical pulse, most accurate pulse at the, again, apex of the heart. You'll hear it with each contraction of the heart. Bradycardia, less than 60 beats per minute. Again, if you know 60 to 100, you know beneath that would be Brady. Brady is Greek for slow. Tacky, over 100. Tacky, Latin for fast. Know your suffixes and know all your terms because it will help you a lot with this. Prefixes and suffixes. Dysrhythmia means odd rhythm. It could literally be beat, beat, beat. You have your normal beat, 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 versus beat, 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 beat. Like it's a dysrhythmia. Something's wrong with the normal rhythm of it. Okay. Now, pulse deficit. This is specifically when there's a difference between the apical pulse and a palpating radial pulse. So if you're listening to the apex and you hear beat, 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 and then you feel the pulse at, at the radio at the same time, and you feel beat, beat, there's a deficit. Something's not going through from what's pumping to that radio. Um, Jennifer, we'll talk about charting when you get into clinicals as well as the actual charting, but it, usually you need to say what you're talking about with tacky, because tacky just means fast. What are we talking about? Are we talking breathing? Are we talking heart rate? What are we talking about? So you need to make sure that you're specific with it. But again, when we get to charting, we'll discuss that. We'll go for a few more minutes. We'll get to 9.30 and then we'll take a break. There it is, okay. Variances in pulse rates. Again, we've already answered the questions. It's like it's important that we've said it twice.
Repeating a slide is not bad for you. Uh, bradycardia, tachycardia, is the rate regular? Is it fast, slow, irregularly fast, irregularly slow? Again, these are just terms we're introducing to you as you start studying, you'll start getting an idea of it. Quality of the pulse. So can I see it bulging when, before I even touch it? Do I put my hand on it and I can't obliterate it or push down enough because it's just so hard? Uh, or is it soft where I can't even feel, I can barely feel it, I have to move or thready? Or is it not there, absent? Uh, when we talk about pulses, we actually grade them from zero to four. Zero being absent, two being what you normally would feel, uh, excuse me, zero to three, and three being bounding. Again, that'll get more when you get into assessment, but just introducing that to you. What iOS bounding? Bounding. Bounding specifically is like you put your hand on there, it's like grabbing onto a water hose with a clump in it, you just feel it like thump, thump, thump. That's what bounding means. When do we know if we need to check a radial against an apical? When you're worried about something, again, when we get to disorders, we'll talk about these pulse deficits. I'm just introducing the term to you. A lot of times that'll be when you're worried about blood flow to that specific area. All right, things that influence the pulse, exercise and activity. Why does exercise increase your pulse? Increased movement, heart rate, skeletal movement. So far, all good questions. We have the heart rate. Well, yeah, I'm saying, yeah. The heart's working harder. Okay, good. The heart is working harder. These are all good answers. More oxygen is needed. The heart is working harder because we have extra, we have uh, we have cells that need more oxygen because we're using them with exercise. So an increase in oxygen demand leads to an increase in pulse to fix said demand. Temperature. We've already talked about metabolic rate, right? So if you have an increase in metabolic rate from my fever, we have an increase in we have an increase in pulse to help with said oxygen demand in those tissues again, because a lot of stuff is going to start breaking down from that and repairing itself. Emotions go either way, depending on the emotion. You're angry, you're angry, your pulse is 120, you're like, ah, okay, that makes sense. Um, if you're sad, depressed, something's going on, you're upset at something, these can drop lower. Um, emotions actually play a very pivotal role in some of these, in all of these vital signs, especially if it's been there for a chronic amount of time. Hot flashes. Oh no, women. Mm, we're talking about women. Uh, we're, we're not talking OB right now. There's a lot of hormones with this. Don't ask me about that. <laughs> okay. So emotions, stimulants, and drugs. Uh, drugs can go either way. Stimulants, you'd expect it to go up. Uh, drugs can go up or down. Uh, hemorrhaging. So what would you expect the pulse to do if someone's bleeding out early? Increase, increase, rapid increase. Yes, you'd expect it up because all of a sudden we have less blood. So our, blood, our body needs that oxygen. So our heart will temporarily go faster to try and get the blood that we do have and the oxygen supply to those tissues. Again, short term. Well, with postural changes, so normally when you stand up, your heart has to quickly adjust. We have a slight change in temperature, or excuse me, a slight change in blood pressure and pulse for that. Um, normally an increase in pulse to compensate for that because all of a sudden our blood is being fully controlled by gravity. And then pain. Pain is completely variable, chronic or acute. It can go up, it can go down, or it can do nothing. So a lot of times when we get when we talk about pain, it's something um, to discuss with vitals. But you can't say somebody's not in pain because their vitals haven't changed. So just know that. Yes, orthostatics as well, which we'll talk about. Hey, more questions. The nurse is assessing the dorsal pedis pulse on an 88-year-old client. She notes the feet to be cold and assesses weak, thready pulses. The nurse's next action would be to what? Okay, we got a lot of A's and a couple B's. Okay, good. So we've got a couple answers. All right, so let's let's stop with this and let's think for just a second. We have somebody who says that we found that their feet 
are, let's see, excuse me, that their feet uh, are cool and that their uh, pulses are weak. So what do we do next? Let's see how we, before we go check the apical and we call the doctor, we have to assess our patient. So we have this, so we need to go figure out how bad it is. So what do we do? We go up to the next pulse and the next pulse and see where those where it's going to. Is it all the way down the leg or is it just at a certain spot? Because if we call if we call the provider and say, hey, his feet are cold and he's got weak pulses. Well, how bad is it? His feet are cold and weak pulses. We need more information. He needs to know how bad it is. Does he need, you know, is it emergent? Do we need to go to surgery right away and to try and fix this? What is it? So we need to make sure we have the right. So the answer with this one would be A, assess popliteal and femoral pulses to make sure the pulses, how far the pulses go down. You know, do I get the popliteal and I still can't feel it? I get the femoral and I can. Okay, so that means that tells me a little bit more information of where whatever blocking, whatever's causing the block is occurring is between there. Do you guys want a break? I see a nod. So let's take, let's take 10 minutes. So we'll say uh, nine, 38, I'll start again.
uh, Chelsea, just to answer, and we're not back yet, but Chelsea, just to answer your question, um, you could feel an irregularity in that. One of the easiest ways to check that uh, would, to, would be to check the apical pulse while you're actually doing the radial, you'd feel differences. Oxygen saturation, yeah, you guys got the answers on those. Megan, it really depends on the loss. Um, you know, if it's extremely constantly occurring, you could have blood loss leading to tachycardia for a short period of time, because of course, then you're not supplying enough oxygen. Um, but if you have a little bit, there, there could be things related to it that could lead to a long-term tachycardia from it.
I love how you guys are collaborating and discussing things that you guys know amongst each other. We appreciate that. Okay, let's get started, let's get moving again. Blood pressure, everybody hear me okay? Yes, okay, good, just wanna make sure. We're trying out a new microphone in this office, so I wanna make sure it sounds good. Blood pressure, another definition slide. Force exerted by the blood when pulsing through the arteries. This changes throughout the day. Uh, it's changes minute by, this changes minute by minute, moment by moment, uh, but we don't check it minute by minute, moment by moment. So systolic, as we've already said, it's that whole squeeze, the most amount of pressure coming out of the heart through the body and diastolic being the lowest amount or the rest. So again, systolic is your squeeze, diastolic is your rest when looking at that. Uh, the standard of measure is MMHG, millimeters of mercury is what that stands for. Pulse pressure being the difference between systolic and diastolic. Again, that will be more important when you really start getting into cardiac uh, next year. But again, introduction to blood pressure. Blood pressure regulation. This measures cardiac function. Peripheral vascular resistance, blood volume. This measure, I mean, there's a lot of different order disorders we've already talked about. And they all can affect this in simple ways by losing blood, by losing uh, the ability to pump, by having additional resistances. I mean, having um, a lot of different things can cause this. Even just squeezing it with, with your actual blood pressure cuff will change your blood pressure. Your body should be able to control your blood pressure with normal activity. What you're worried about is if the body's blood pressure and vital signs overall don't stabilize after activities or in general to those normal numbers. You'd expect somebody who's exercising, you'd expect to see an increase in respirations and heart rate. You'd expect to see, um, you would not expect to see a drop in heart rate or like, and someone passing out when they're exercising. You would not expect that. That's what I mean by, again, understand. My heart should be able to handle my activity. So if they start having problems with activity, you know something's wrong. Different things that affect the blood pressure. We've got age and gender. Uh, stress in general increases the blood pressure. Uh, race, uh, the blood pressures tend to be different. Uh, different races can lead to those. Um, uh, hemorrhaging, we have a low decrease in volume. Therefore, we have a decrease in pressure specifically know the difference. If I have a decrease in volume, I'd expect my pulse to go up and my pressure to go down because I have less to push. Stress test, uh, Emily, we're talking about stress tests. We're talking specifically about the heart. Again, cardiac, you'll get into that. But all we're looking for is to make sure your heart can handle the stress of a normal activity of like walking up the stairs. That's what that stress test is doing and seeing if there's a problem when you do have activities. Uh, Daily variations, again, lowest in the morning. Um, medications can lower them or increase them, again, based on what you're taking them for or what their side effects are. Any activity, um, again, exercise increases it. Uh, after exercise, you should actually see blood pressure decrease lower than it was after exercise. That's why we say exercise every day to help with that. Pain, acute pain tends to increase blood pressure. Again, doesn't have to. And chronic pain tends to lower blood pressure. Again, doesn't have to. Um, there's no, there could be no change as well. Why does smoking change blood pressure? What does that do? Oh, I see, constriction dilation. So vasoconstriction is what this does, absolutely. And you need to know this because smoking is one of the things you're going to educate on a lot. You need to make sure that people know what it does and what can cause 
uh, and the problems that it can do. So yeah, absolutely, it increases that blood pressure. If somebody comes in and says, oh, I've been smoking for years, and they're on you know three or four different blood pressure medications, you know, you can tell them, hey, you need to look at stopping that. You know, the provider, your provider may be able to help you more if you stop with that smoking. That may be one of your major causes. So. Measuring blood pressure, indirect or non-invasive, which is what all of you, probably in the next few weeks, will be doing for the rest of your life. Blood pressure cuffs and sphygmomanometers. Know your words. I don't know if you know how to spell it, but it's fun to try. It's the most common. You've got the accurate estimate of arterial uh, blood pressure obtained by measuring and squeezing to see how much pressure it takes for flow to go through, okay? The direct method is something that you will not do unless you are a flight nurse, critical care nurse, uh, some ER, but for the most part, it's an extremely ill patient. So blood pressure cuffs, you'll do, as we said, you know, every few hours, every few weeks, just to kind of see. When you talk about direct, you've got a line into their heart and you're checking to see what that pressure is coming out every second, okay? That is not a normal thing to do because somebody has the cold. That's a major problem. So we have to make sure on really critically our patients that we have the ability to check that pressure at all times. The equipment, sphygmomanometer. Just a vinyl, it's a cuff with a pressure bulb that again, all we're trying to do is squeeze the pressure down in our arm or wherever we're checking it and make sure that it's completely occluded or obliterated, it's completely gone, and then slowly, de slowly decrease the pressure until we figure out how much pressure it takes for us to overcome and how much pressure that's actually coming out. That'll tell us how much blood pressure they have. That first little bit would be checking your systole, and when the pressure completely goes away when you're listening to it, that would be diastole. Uh, that's your upper number versus your lower number. Bridget, we're talking about central lines uh, and arterial lines specifically. But again, don't worry about that right now. I'm just introducing it to you. Like any vital sign, you need to know what tool you need to check blood pressure. You can't check a blood pressure by squeezing somebody's arm. You need a sphygmomanometer. You need a stethoscope. They, we do have equipment to do that. But one of my biggest things that I tell everyone is when you are checking blood pressures, yes, you can check. You have a cool machine, but it's not always right. And I've got a story about it in just a moment, but... It's not always right and always trust your assessment over a machine's assessment. Uh, Abraham, to, to answer yours, there's actually genetic variations that change blood pressures on every race. There's your machines for it. Now, you've got your automatic, you've got your manuals when we're talking about this. If the automatic is off, again, check a manual. I had a nursing student come up to me and say, hey, I checked this patient's blood pressure and it was weird. It was 208 over 140. Isn't that weird? Is that off? Something wrong with 208? What do you guys think? 208 over 140. How do you think I felt? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I didn't. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Butt pucker, move. I stopped everything I was doing and got moving. I went and checked on that patient. I wanted to check the vitals. What did I, what did I find? They had checked it with an automatic. Okay, fine. I asked specifically, and I will ask everyone this. What was the manual? Check a manual. Listen to your assessment skills. The manual said 124 over 86. The patient was fine. The machine had not been calibrated correctly recently. And there was no way to know that until you start thinking somebody's having a stroke from it, okay? Could be a loose cuff, could be in there incorrectly, but it turned out to be an improperly calibrated machine. So again, you find something wrong, make sure you assess it. Make sure you do it appropriately with the manual determinants. Yes, uh, Madison, to answer your question, you're asking um, about rechecking a blood pressure. You do need to wait four to five minutes from checking a blood pressure on a specific arm. You can go to the other arm, um, but you may be restricted on that. But when you check it, you need to wait a few minutes beforehand to recheck it because your body is constantly under homeostasis. We've already talked about that. 
So when it starts seeing that there's squeezing, there's occlusions occurring, your body recognizes it and begins to elevate your blood pressure. So if you squeeze it, do the blood pressure once and then do it again right after, more than likely it'll be slightly elevated. It'll keep doing it unless you let the body rest for a moment. They start crashing rapidly. Do you check blood pressure before intervention? We'll get to that when we get into that. Let's talk about vital signs in general. Depending on the situation, you would absolutely intervene first, but we'll discuss that when we get into case studies. Uh, if you check about uh, do a manual blood pressure and it's high, would you always check the other arm too? I would just because I'm not going to wait four to five minutes to check it again if it's already high. I want to make sure to see what's going on. All right, measuring blood pressure. Practice this. You're going to do it in clinical. You're going to do it in lab and know how to do this, okay? Um, again, this is the big slide where I normally talk about doing this multiple times. You've already got it. Don't do it on the same arm multiple times unless you're waiting those four to five minutes. And there's a type of blood pressure check, which um, is actually dealing with orthostatics or orthostatic vitals, where you have to specifically have the patient lying down uh, flat, check the blood pressure, have them sit up on the side of the bed for five minutes, do not wait shorter, five minutes, then you check their blood pressure again, then you have them stand, wait five minutes, and then do it again. That will tell us if there's a problem or orthostatic tilt, if there's a problem with their blood pressure and heart rate and they can't control what's going on with their body, okay? Would it be possible for a machine to record a high blood pressure as normal if it wasn't calibrated properly? Correct, yes, it could absolutely measure it low or high, absolutely. I saw one with 306 over 170 on a, on a toddler. I said, that's not right. So that happens. So make sure you know your equipment. Karat cough sounds, definition slide, okay? Sounds that you hear during auscultation with the blood pressure cuff. If any of you have experience with some of these questions I'm hearing, I can, or some of these answers, I bet you some of you do. Um, when you're checking a blood pressure cuff, you usually hear first and last sound. That's usually what you're checking for. Karat cough talks about five different sounds, okay? And the next slide will help you. You can read into these a little bit, but the next, and you can actually click this link here to kind of listen to it. But the next slide will help you visualize it a little bit more talking about the first phase versus the fifth phase, the thump, the blowing, the whooshing, the thump again. Again, this is the definition of what we're talking about with the Karatkov sounds. Don't get lost in it. It's a definition slide just to introduce in case somebody says, or you see the Karatkov signs, we're talking about blood pressures. Classifications. Now, this is what's called JNC7. These are the original, since 2008, blood pressure categories. Normal, prehypertensive, hypertension, stage one, and stage two. Your book uses these, this is what we're doing. You're, you may see other categories, you may see other ways of categorizing it, but this is what we're teaching you. So your normal blood pressure, as I've already said, is less than 120 over 80. Prehypertension is 120 over 139, excuse me, 120 to 139 over 80 to 89. Hypertension, um, stage one being 140 to 159 over 90 to 99, and stage two being anything over 160 over 100. With that being said, both of these do not have to be there. If you've got a patient whose blood pressure is 119 over 87, they're prehypertensive. You only need one of these numbers to be in there to be considered in this category. Somebody's blood pressure is 137 over 102, they're stage two hypertension. Only one of the numbers has to be there. Now, with that being said, there's a lot of numbers here. One of the things that I always tell people when you're talking about this is remember the, remember the fraction 19 over nine and remember your normal number. If you start at 120 over 80, underneath and then add 19 to the top number and nine to the bottom number, you've got prehypertension. If you add 19 to the, the top number of the prehypertension and nine on the bottom, you've got stage one. Anything over that would be stage two to help you study and try to remember this rather than just trying to memorize numbers. I hope that helps. Prehypertension, 
blood pressure reading of 120 over, again, their numbers are there for you. This is uh, obtained from two readings taken six minutes apart with the client sitting, okay? If it's too close together, it's a falsely elevated second blood pressure. We need to make sure, okay? That's why we give that six minutes between. We usually, if we have a diagnosis, we have a, uh, a blood pressure that's high, we'll check it and then we'll come back six minutes later and check it again. Hypertension, so that would be your prehypertension. Hypertension is de defined there as well. For hypertension, it's a major, it is a major illness. It's a lot of different people have this. I believe the last number was 60 to 70% of the American population has uh, some sort of hypertension, whether it be primary or secondary, whatever the cause is, it's hypertension. So, and it consists of, you know, constant pressure on the vessels and the organs, especially the things like the heart and the kidneys, which is the first organ fed by the, heart, the descending aorta. So it does a lot of damage when they're there. And a lot of times it's called the silent killer because for the longest time you won't have any symptoms until there's already a lot of damage. Primary specifically would be no known cause. We don't know what it is, okay? Uh, let's see, can usually be caused by overweight or obesity, right? Yes, you absolutely can have that. That would be more secondary hypertension, but you can just have genetic, um, you can just have genetic abnormalities leading to hypertension that it's just almost impossible to control without medications. Hypotension, systolic blood pressure beneath 100 millimeters of mercury. You usually would think about this. If we're not getting enough pressure, if we're not getting enough tissue, it's lightheaded, we're fatigued, we're dizzy. You can have those orthostatics we talked about, sudden drop in blood pressure. The two readings from both arms and then six minutes from later, two arm reading again. You can just do, no, two readings would just, if I just have it on one arm and then wait six minutes and check the arm again, that's good um, because I'm, I'm at that point diagnosing it or I'm helping diagnose it, I should say. Uh, but if you did do two readings, as we were saying, where you would check it, you think it's low, you check the other side, then yeah, if we already have both of them low, then you can go ahead and go to the other side and just need one more reading to get it. But again, that's going to be based on policy. That's going to be based on where you're working. Just remember that when you do it, you need at least two high readings for that. Clicker check. The clinic nurse is reviewing the blood pressure reading from the client's home self-monitoring device. The client states, look, yesterday my blood pressure jumped to 150 over 90. I should be taking more medicine. What's your best response? There we go, C, absolutely. Uh, the doctor will first look at the pattern of your results. So yeah, we're not gonna say yes, we're not gonna start agreeing and say yes, absolutely. Or yes, I'm sure the physician will do that. That's not your job. Your job is to take the findings, discuss it with them, and the provider will actually make sure that the diagnosis is correct and any treatments necessary. So, common errors, blood pressure too wide or too narrow? Too wide tends to give you uh, more of a false high because you need more pressure with it, and too narrow can give you more of a false low. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, let's see. So um, deflating the cuff too slowly or too rapidly can also change it because you can't hear it appropriately. Um, if the cuff is wrapped too loosely, we can have other problems. If the arm is above the level of the heart or below the level of the heart, that's why we have people sit appropriately. That's when we're going to make sure that they've got it and they check their blood pressure then. So we don't have uppers or too high or too low. Respirations. The exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the body. We've got mechanical and we've got chemical. Mechanical, this is breathing, moving air in and out of lungs, okay? You've got inspiration, which is drawing in, and expiration, which is expelling air. We have a change in thoracic cavity. This just explains specifically how we create a vacuum. When we breathe, we don't suck air in, we create a vacuum to have air automatically pulled in. Our lungs don't do that, they just create the vacuum. 
you have your chemical respiration, which is the actual act of oxygen and carbon dioxide being exchanged in the lung tissue, alveoli. And there's your ventilation, your rates, 12 to 20. Tachypnea, definitions, okay? Tachypnea, over 20. Bradypnea, less than 12. If you know your 12 to 20, then you know which one's fast and which one's slow. Apnea, you see an A before it? Nothing. Apnea, no breathing. If you want, uh, there's a lot of these. So page 436 will show you a different rates and rhythms of breathing to help you start studying those as well. This is showing you just the images of specifically how those respirations occur. Eupnea, EU, normal, okay? Normal respirations in breath. Bradypnea, decreased respirations. And it goes through all these things again for you. Tachypnea, apnea, hyperventilation, this would be more of an increased rate and depth. This is combining terms. Hypoventilation being decreased rate and depth. So it's more, you know, hyper would be, uh, 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 and then you've got your hypo, which would be barely, like, you've got to go through and start thinking about it. The nice thing is, is if you can't remember this term when you're charting, you can specifically chart what you see. Variations and findings again. Apnea, no breathing, cessation. Bradypnea, slow. It's like it's important to know these terms for your entire nursing career because they keep showing up. If somebody is taking a narcotic, I know it's a big issue right now, but we think about a decreased rate, we think about decreased depth, we'd have to make sure we assess that patient to make sure they're actually breathing. And there could be all of a sudden a sudden change in breathing because of Something's wrong. It could be a medication or something could, a status change overall. We assess it. We recognize what's normal and see when something changes. Rhythm. There is a link on both of these. You can go listen to them. But when we're talking about rhythm, we're talking about assessment, the patterns. Is, are we breathing, you know, the normal in, out, no problems? Are we breathing heavily uh, with chain stokes? Again, this is all based on different disorders, but for chain stokes, you, it's, ra it's deep, rapid breaths that begin to slow and then nothing. And then all of a sudden, deep, rapid breaths that begin to slow and then nothing. You'll need to know that as you get into different disorders, but that's just showing an abnormality where Kuzmals is just more of that deep, rapid, something's wrong, okay? Uh, to answer your question, bradypnea versus hypoventilation, that's, the bradypnea is just that slowed rate. Hypoventilation is the slowed rate with a shallow breathing as well. Tachypnea, same thing. With tachypnea would just be rapid, where hyperventilation would be rapid and deep ventilation. Correct. It would be about depth. And then you've got your work of breathing. Dyspnea, if it's difficult for them to breathe, DY, difficult. Orthopnea, inability to breathe when they're standing or laying, specifically on this one will be laying. We're doing good. Nurse will expect to find a slow respiratory rate in the client who has smoked for many years, true or false? Good, good, false, absolutely. We've got scar tissue, we've got damage to the lungs. We, we're not getting the oxygen that we need normally. So it's going to actually be an increased rate to get the oxygen we can in and out. Factors, age. You asked about children, I'm just gonna throw a number at you. Adults, we've already said 12 to 20. Newborns are 40 to 90. So know that the age can change this, okay? Emotions. Stress increases, can increase respirations. Activity and pain, I think we've gone over this enough for you to start recognizing how these work. Narcotics themselves decrease depth and rate. When we talk about pain and we get into that, into pharmacology, it'll make more sense if you don't understand it now. Uh, diseases, these do damage, okay? And BMRs, there's a lot of different things that a disease can do to change respirations. Fever, even a one degree change in fever increases breaths per minute by four on average. Smoking, 
we've already talked about it, decreases elasticity and does damage, which leads to increased respirational needs. The position, if I'm, you know, if I'm hunched over having a hard, you know, just kind of like this, it's hard to get my breaths in, where if I'm kind of opened up and got my whole lung field open, it's easier for me to breathe. No, fever would increase respiration. So if I said that, I said it backwards, I apologize. Fever, one degree of fever increases respirations by four. And stress, emotions. ABGs, this is next year. This is a whole section of its own, but it's not a vital sign. It gets you a whole bunch of information about what's currently in the arteries. Um, and we'll discuss that again later. But there's pulse ox. Again, it looks at the oxygen saturation. We talked about 95 to 100%. Um, but it could be off. Their fingers could be cold. They could have nail polish on them. Um, they may have you know, a lot of different problems that occur that gives us a bad reading. So we need to check that, maybe change fingers or maybe hold their hand for a moment, see if we can warm up their hand for a moment to get a good reading. Be sure the equipment, always check your equipment before your treatment um, in oxygen saturation. Um, the patient may look bad, but you always wanna make sure that equipment's right because if that, if that patient's, you know, it says 82% and that patient's just staring at you, He's like, he's just talking to you. Check that finger. Let's make sure that's actually correct and kind of go around. ABG stands for arterial blood glass, yes. Responsibility. Be sure that when you take care of a patient or you have somebody do something for your patient, know it's your patient. If you have an aide or a student check a blood pressure, and something's wrong, it's up to you as the nurse to intervene, to do something. If they say, hey, my blood pressure I just read is 240 over 109, did they check a manual? And if they did, go check it yourself anyway. Go in with them, check your patient, okay? Make sure that you know that it's your responsibility to take care of it, delegate it or not, okay? That would be scope of practice. Now, again, blood pressure, we wanna check a manual. Now, what if somebody says their urine's, you know, we haven't really talked about urine, but if their urine's gone down, they'll, oh, I thought their urine looked weird. Go check it. Go open up the chart, see, did they, have they been urinating normally? Has it been a normal amount? What is their normal amount? Go through it. Finger device measures oxygen, uh, Charlotte, by actually putting infrared level, uh, infrared laser through your fingers, going through the red blood cells and actually can measure the amount of oxygen in those red blood cells. Let's do some questions. Which of the following values for vital signs would the nurse address first? See a heart rate of 72, that's what's normal, all right? Respiration, okay, we've got a respiration of 20, I'm worried about it, but blood pressure, 160 over 86, we've got some hypertension, but oxygen sats by pulse ox. So again, think nursing questions, here you go. What would you do first? Who will die if you don't do it? Heart rates, okay, it's normal. Respirations, a little high, but you can let it be for a minute. Blood pressure, a little high, Oxygen sat, their tissues are not getting fully saturated with oxygen. We have a problem. This is how you think through these. The client who's been on bed rest for two days asked to get out of bed to go to the bathroom. He has new orders for up ad lib. Which action should the nurse take? You've got somebody who's a little slower on this one. That's okay. That's okay. Okay. I'm seeing a couple different answers. A lot of C's. Okay. So the answer here is C. Absolutely. Obtain orthostatic vitals. They've been on bed rest for two days and they want to get out of bed because he wants, and you have orders that lets him get up as he wants to ad lib. So, Give him some slippers and tell him where the bathroom is? No, absolutely not. You're now, he hasn't moved in two days. You don't know what he's going to do. He may fall the moment he sits on the side of the bed, let alone stand up and walk. Ask the nursing assistant to assist him. You are deferring. When you are doing nursing questions, 
99% of the time, there's always that one, you do not defer somebody to somebody that you can do. Ask the assistant to assist them to the bathroom. Why can't you do it? It doesn't say anything in the question that says you can't do it. It just says this patient's asking to go. You could bring them, but we need to obtain orthostatic blood pressure. We need to obtain orthostatic blood pressure. They haven't moved in two days, so we want to do that. Have them lay for five minutes, have them lay down, take blood pressure, sit up for five minutes, check blood pressure, and then stand up with you right there and check blood pressure again after five minutes. Make sure they're not going to pass out or fall on you. Tell him it's not a good idea to provide a urinal. That would not be the right answer. He can do it. You have that. It says right there, up ad lib. He can go. Just make sure he's safe to do it. And you'll probably still need to assist him to make sure nothing happens. If he needs to urgently go and it's not safe, okay, that's where, where specifically in this question. Nothing in the question. Don't add. Don't add this. And if Professor Stam is listening, she'll say, don't add anything to the question. All it says is he wants to go to the bathroom. Doesn't say urgent, doesn't say I gotta go now or I'm gonna wet the bed. All it says is he wants to go get out of the bed and go to the bathroom. All it says. Okay. Using an oral electrothermometer, the nurse checks the early morning temperature of a client. The client's temperature is this. The client's remaining vital signs are in the normal acceptable range. What should the nurse do next? Okay, so see a lot of A's, a lot of B's. Okay, 97 degrees Fahrenheit. That is within range. We're good. We don't have to check the client's temperature history. We just document it. The temperature is within normal results. There's nothing in here that says this patient normally has a problem. All it says is that you've checked this patient's temperature and this is it. The question's over. Don't think about, well, what if they have different things? Nothing in here makes you think that, so don't add that. Okay, is this open with these questions? Good, do one more. The nurse decides to take an apical pulse instead of a radial pulse. Which the following client conditions influence the nurse's decision? Okay, we've got a lot, a lot, a lot of Bs. Yes, the answer is B. The client's in shock, that didn't pop up. Well, that's good, because we have other things to do with the shock, so don't worry about that. Uh, the client has a dysrhythmia. Yes, we need to verify. We need to say, okay, let's actually assess and check that apical pulse and see what's going on with it. Does it sound like that? Uh, what does it sound like? The client underwent surgery 18 hours earlier. Yes, I'd check an apical, but that doesn't make me choose apical. I will check all the pulses then, not just apical. Uh, the client showed a response to orthostatic changes. No, that doesn't really make me want to do an, ortho, uh, an apical pulse at that point. So again, the question is asking about an apical pulse and why you would choose specifically that. The answer at that point being B, they have a dysrhythmia. I need to further assess the dysrhythmia by auscultating or listening to the heart. Ah, all right. I'm going to stop sharing.